All right, our next speaker is Cook County Board President. She served in that position for four years and just earned a second term. She's a fabulous public servant and a City Club of Chicago member, a fabulous City Club of Chicago member for which we are enormously grateful. Cook County Board President, Tony Preckwinkle. All right, Madam President. Good afternoon, everybody. Our guest today is Cook County Recorder of Deeds, Karen Yarborough. She's a full-time administrator who oversees a $12 million budget. She has 180 employees, which makes it the second largest recorder's office in the United States. She earned her bachelor's degree from, in, excuse me, in business management from Chicago State University, and she has a master's degree in inner city studies from Northeastern University. She and her husband, Henderson, have a blended family of six. They share 12 grandchildren and three great-grandchildren. Please welcome Recorder of Deeds, Karen Yarborough. Thank you. Good afternoon. Oh, that sound rousing. Do that again. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Karen Yarbrough, and I was happy to be here today and happy to see all of you here today. I want to talk to you today just a little bit about the Recorder Deeds Office, that obscure office over in the corner in the dark somewhere that nobody knows about but is intertwined in all of your lives. How many of you own your own home? I'm talking to you today, okay. Um, I wanna thank uh, Cook County Board President, uh, Tony Preckwinkle, who I think is doing a fabulous job as our president of Cook County. When I came into the recorder's office, um, she and the other commissioners allowed me to readjust my budget so that it would reflect our priorities. So Madam President, thank you so much and, and my warmest personal regards to all the commissioners for doing that. Uh, my priorities were not my predecessor's priorities, and we've actually gotten some really great things done. So this table right here, actually, these people are my employees, and I'm so happy to see them here today. I didn't have to beat them or anything like that. They actually <laughs> showed up because they wanted to be here, and I'm glad to see them all. So I want to talk uh, briefly about me. So I've been on a journey, and um, my background is in private sector. I you know, ran a business for about 30 years. I was an independent insurance agent, and I sold real estate, and I loved that job. Um, nothing like getting up in the morning and being able to meet with a client and help them to achieve their goal of home ownership. I, transition to public service, and one of the questions I always got was, Karen, why would an independent businesswoman want to go to the General Assembly and deal with all that quote unquote nonsense? And I would tell people, well, you know, I've always wanted to, to help people, but I wanted to do it at a certain level where I could really effectuate, you know, public policy and make changes at that level. Well, I got a chance to do some of that work, and I spent 12 years there. One of the things that I'm most proud of is passing the smoke-free Illinois bill. And you all can thank me right now that we're not in a place where you're having to struggle with smoke. Thank me. It was a tough bill to, to carry because, um, you know, the restaurants thought that they were gonna lose money and what we found out is just the opposite of that. What happened is people who normally didn't go to certain restaurants because they were so smoke-filled started going out again. We women, you know, we get our hair done. We do not like the smoke in our hair, nor do we like the smoke in our clothes. And so we have this smoke-free environment. So you can thank me again. <laughs> the most difficult bill I, I carried in Springfield was to abolish the death penalty. 
Um, I felt like I was on a roller coaster um, in championing this particular issue. It was an issue that I actually evolved to because I get the other side of the issue that some there's some bad people in this world, and you know why should they live? But there was the other side to this issue, and the, the people that made it very, very clear to me were the victims of violent crimes. These are the victims' family members, and they're the ones that sat me down and said, Karen, it's just not the right thing to do. It doesn't help us at all, and we want you to champion this issue. So Illinois became the 16th state to abolish the death penalty. I actually got a chance to go to Rome. They lit up the Coliseum for Illinois that we finally got it and got rid of that onerous law. So you can thank me again. So I attained a number of leadership roles uh, during the course of that 12 years. I became an assistant majority leader in the Illinois House of Representatives, and what that simply meant is I ended up with a lot more uh, work on my plate because um, I don't know if you all know Michael Madigan, the Speaker of the House, but that guy is there 24-7. He reads every single bill and every single amendment and his leadership team, we do the same. So I was there on Sundays and Mondays and Tuesdays and if we were in session Tuesday through Wednesday, I was there from Sunday to Friday or whatever it took. We would meet sometimes in, in the Chicago area, but most of the time it was in Springfield. Some people here ask me, do I miss being in Springfield? And I will just tell you that um, I never, it never bothered me about dri the drive to Springfield. Now, I got to tell you a funny story, and I don't tell funny stories, okay? And I don't tell jokes because I don't even get them sometimes. But <laughs> one of my colleagues, um, I think she'll remain nameless, she got in her car and she was always on her telephone. Now this was before the, the law that you couldn't you know, have you. But she got on the phone and she started in Chicago and she looked up and she saw the arches. So you know, she kind of ran past Springfield. But you can get a lot of stuff done during the course of driving to Springfield. You could read bills. I mean, if you're not driving, that is. You could listen to stuff. You could talk to people on the phone. So there are a lot of things that you could get done. It never bothered me about the drive to Springfield. So I think I'm supposed to do this now. My priorities in Springfield were public health, social justice, and public safety. Those particular issues, and if you look, my legislative record is there, I spent a lot of time dealing with housing issues. And so 2008 was very, very significant, not just in the state of Illinois. It was significant all across the country and actually all across the world. And why is that? Because the bubble burst. The 2008 crash of the housing industry was affecting people and communities all across Cook County and all across the Illinois. Fraud, foreclosures, vacant property, squatters, lower property values. That conversation, we talk about that even today having a conversation with uh, one of my mayors that, that I used to represent in, in uh, Springfield, uh, he was just talking about this very issue of what's going on in, in the housing market. Now we know it's coming back little by little, but I tell you what, um, there's been a lot of damage done, a lot of damage done. So... ...forged documents in order to steal a home outright. Sound far-fetched? This is a kind of crime that I never imagined that could happen. It did to Chicago Treasurer Stephanie Neely. I don't know if you all saw that before, but that's part of the reason why I left Springfield. After the 2008 bursting of the bubble and all these things that were happening with housing, I read an article in the New York Times and Stephanie Neely was featured in that article where someone had changed the name on her deed in my office now, in the recorder's office. So when I read, the caption said, if you think you own your home, check the deed. Now that sounded kind of silly at the time when I first read it, so I had to read the entire article. But come to find out, not just her, but about 30 other people, these sovereign citizens, had actually changed names on paperwork at my office and 
created all kinds of problems and stuff for people. And if it could happen to Stephanie Neely, could it happen to me? Absolutely. So I started looking at the recorder's office. The, the recorder at the time was going to retire. And I said, here's an office that I can go to and really make a difference. I could become the chief advocate for people Homeowners. Now, the folks that own these big buildings downtown in Chicago and what have you, they have lawyers to protect their interests. Who do the homeowners have? Once something like this happens to you, and Stephanie would tell you, she had to pay an attorney to unwind this for her. While she could afford that, what about grandma on the south side of Chicago? What about somebody who just is not sophisticated and doesn't really understand the process at all? Who do they have? And they're victimized twice because this happens to them, and then they turn around and can have to have the money to hire an attorney to unwind it for them. It's not right. It's not good. So one thing I knew about the recorder's office, they had a free property fraud alert program, and I see our good friends from Fiddler are here. Hi, guys. I met these guys when I first got in office, and I wanted to take a look at, you know, how does this fraud uh, program work? How, you know, how do we protect homeowners? What does it do? So they explained it to me, and it wasn't working quite right. We had only done about 500 sign-ups. And I'm, and I'm thinking something like this, it's kind of like uh, anybody been a victim of, um, you know, you, 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 somebody took and opened up a credit card in your name? Identity theft? Anybody know what identity? Oh, I see some hands went up. So identity theft, it's horrific. Somebody steals your identity, they go max out some credit cards, and then you get the phone call saying that you owe money and you didn't even have this credit card. Have you, how did that work out for you, by the way? Yeah, it's bad. Of course it is. You didn't create the problem, but now you've got to get it fixed. Well, your home is your most valuable asset, and this happening to sophisticated people like Stephanie Neely, and it could happen to me and you and anybody else, and unsuspecting people who are just not sophisticated to even understand processes. So I felt that now more than ever, property owners needed to be engaged to protect their most valuable asset. You have to have a stake in this process. When we go to the closing table, by the way, I'm a realtor, so you go to the closing table and you sign all of these documents and you get the keys to your house, you take those documents home, you put them in a safety deposit box or you put them in a drawer and you never look at those things again. How many of you here have checked your chain of title this year? One, two, three, four, five. Oh, that's because you know better. <laughs> The rest of you have not checked your chain of title. So you could go to cookrecorder.com, put your PIN number in, and you could take a look and see on your chain of title for your property what's there. You could do that, but you haven't. How many of you will be doing that today? Oh, everybody, okay, I want you to do that. And then when you see that there may be a problem there, then you need to call me. Or maybe you can call a lawyer. We got any lawyers in the house? Yeah, we got lawyers in the house. Call some of them. I'm much cheaper. So Cook County homeowners needed an advocate, and the recorder's office needed a caretaker. That would be me. So the fine people of Cook County gave me an opportunity to make some changes in the recorder's office. The fine people in Cook County um, trusted the, the fact that I've been an advocate all my life. Uh, I know how to get things done. I know how to build coalitions. And when I see problems, I want to fix them. So this was a perfect opportunity for me to do this. So question I always get, do you miss the legislature? And my answer is 12 years is long enough to be anywhere. You can get some things done. But the second thing, I don't miss the circus. I do miss some of the clowns, though. <laughs> I love the legislature because I think um, in my heart of hearts, I am a legislator. But you know, you use legislation to fix things, to fix problems. And so when I see problems that arise, I try to see how and what we need to do 
to create public value in public service. So why the recorder's office? Um, there was underperformance there. There was an opportunity to highlight its relevancy and need. It was a chance to retrofit and produce real public value, and I could bring all the skills that I had to bear. Now, one of the first questions I had to answer uh, when I came in, I was, you know, I, 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 I think I, um, in the primary, I won the primary, and the first thing I had to do is go before the, um, the board and say, hey, look, this office is valuable. Um, it does not need to be consolidated with another office. So I was in front of Tony and the board and saying, we don't need to do this at this point. I had had a conversation with the former commissioner uh, Quigley, and I asked him because he presented this, I guess, to the board about consolidation of the office. And he, you know, I asked him, I said, so why did you want to do this? Did this make sense? He said, well, you know, you, you could maybe save some money, but I'm not so sure. So Commissioner Fritchie, somebody who I served with in Springfield, I talked to him about it. And he says, well, you know, I think we can, we can save some money. I said, well, how much money can we save? He said, oh, we can save a million dollars, I'm sure. And I said, Fritchie, we could lose a million dollars, too. I said, now, do the people in the recorder's office know what the clerk's office does? Do you know what they do? You don't? No? No, they don't know what they do. You know what you do. <laughs> yes, you do. But we don't know what they do. They don't know what we do. We, our computers don't talk to each other. Um, and again, all of this retrofitting and doing all of these things you're talking about doing, it's a good possibility we make a big mess. I wanted to get into the office. I wanted to have the opportunity to create real public value and do something with the office that would make sense and that would people would appreciate. So the fact that all of you are here, I hope that you take from me today that the recorder's office is a very important office. It's a small office. It generates you know, real significant dollars to the county board. They're very happy with what we do, but we have to do it efficiently. So that's the first thing I had to do, coming into the office, defend the office. Now, our staff doesn't just record. They're trained to protect the chain of title and to ensure documents are recorded properly. I have four generations of people in this office. And in some cases, some of them don't have 21st century skills. So we opened up a training center in the office to be able to give them access to um, technology. And they can do this on their own time. If they want more, they can get more. We're doing, we're trying to build up our workforce because it's the most valuable thing that we have there. And I want their institutional knowledge. Did I say that we have four generations of people in our office? Now, I don't remember how old the oldest person is, but four generations of workers. So you can imagine what that's like. So Cook County is large, and consolidating the office would result in less accountability to taxpayers. And to those who think that consolidation would work, I would offer that the cost of consolidation, training equipment, et cetera, no, I don't think it would work. Now, we are going to do our own study, study to take a look at this idea because I know that the the board is always looking for opportunities to um, do more with less and all of those kinds of things but we don't want to miss an opportunity here to help people um, in public service that's what we do that is what my job is so our statement of purpose most people know that we record store and maintain land records we facilitate home ownership and property lending. Our staff works to provide access to this information in an efficient, courteous manner, both in our offices and online. Many of you told me today that you really like our new website. Well, I have some talented staff, and they walked in the door just like I did. I cut their salaries, and I told them, you got to work hard for the recorder's office, and I'll see you next year. We'll see what we can do about salaries. You all never did these jobs before, and neither have I, so we don't deserve anything. Let's get this job done. So they said, okay. Anyway, uh, um, John Markovic, where's John? John. John Markovic, I'm so lucky to have him, and I'll tell you why. John worked with me almost 10 years in Springfield. 
And so he knew me before I got to the recorder's office. He knew lots of things about me, and I knew lots of things about him. He could finish my sentences. But I also knew he was young, gifted, and talented. And the first thing he did, he said, I want to do the website. And I'm like, be my guest. Boy, did we save money on that. So John did our website, and why don't you give him a round of applause? Thank you, John. <laughs> Okay, the other thing we do is safeguard vital military discharge records. We have an um, uh, office on the first floor, our property fraud office, as well as our, our uh, office for our veterans. We have a veteran service office. We open up that office, and some of you came to our, our event. Um, people didn't know that we recorded military discharge papers, but they're important. And I got to tell you that today, um, I, I know two years ago, maybe somebody would wander in that office um, once or twice a week. But Brian tells me that we're, we have an uptick of people who are coming into that office between 25 and 30 a day to record their discharge papers and to get their military discount card. That's our, a new initiative that we have that we're working with Cook County on. So I talked about defending the existence of the office. Um, these are some of the problems I had. Problems with clouded hiring prior to coming in. I inherited a federal hiring monitor. You, can, you can't even imagine what that's like. Four generations of employees um, that some lack 21st century skills. And the public doesn't know what my office does. But you're going to tell them, right? You're going to tell them that this is an important office, and it does good work, and it does important work for the Cook County residents. That's what you're going to tell them, right? OK. This is what we've done in two years. We've made this office a national leader in property fraud awareness. And that is one, that's the centerpiece of this administration. We want people to know they have to check their chain of title. They have to sign up for our property fraud alert program. It's a free program. It can save you money. It can give you peace of mind, and you can sleep at night. These people who do these things, like doctoring up paperwork and recording it in our office, they get a different um, group of folks that you know uh, see them when they walk in the door. Now, these sovereigns, everybody know what a sovereign citizen is? They're the people that cloud titles. They're the people that come in and do this stuff. And they're anti-government extremists, and they don't care what you think. They're the people that change the locks on people's doors when they're gone. And then they take up residence, residence in their property while you're away on vacation. How would you like that when you came back from a two-month vacation and you found out your locks were changed on your door? And what would you do about it? Call the police and tell somebody that somebody stole your house? And they'd laugh at you and hang the phone up. Because that's what they did to an 82-year-old lady on the south side of Chicago. She actually watched somebody changing the locks on her door. And she called our office because we had worked with her before. And she told us what was going on. And what we did was we talked to the officer and say, hey, look, the paperwork that you're looking at is fraudulent. So they carted that guy away, and he got arrested. And he's doing time. Now, yeah, I spent some time in Springfield, so you know I know how to pass a bill. We actually got three bills passed so that we would have the tools that we need to go after these characters. We're working with the FBI, with the state's attorney's office, and with the Chicago Police Department so that you will not be victims of these crimes. So. We do outreaches every day. I was in outreach last night until I guess it was almost 10 o'clock last night. We're trying to get the message out, and we're looking for more and more ways to get the message to the people who need to hear it. These predators go after seniors, people of color, and communities who have a lot of foreclosures and vacant buildings, people who don't know, and some people who don't know they don't know. So. Anybody who has an opportunity for the Cook County Recorder of Deeds office to come out to your venue, we're happy to do that so that we can talk to your constituents. So these are highlights again, fiscal responsibility, doing more with less each year. 
we've had significant progress towards implementing anti-political hiring regulations, improved and more informative website, thanks John Merkovic. Um, we have a monthly TV show, and we have folks to come on that show, and uh, it's, it's a live show, so people actually call into the show. My plan is to build the absolute best recorder's office in the nation, best recorder's office in the nation. And I have a talented workforce that can help make that happen. And we're working right now to do uh, a number of different things. We're going to have a, um, we've just, our, one of our vendors is here back there that's um, helping us. To, they're going to put an RFP on the street in order to have our first core application in, in 10 years. Now this is definitely going to save the county some money and it's going to save our office some money. We want to be the best. We want to take this office from a place where fraud happens to a place where fraud is confronted. And it's funny nowadays when the little red hat people come in, that's what I call them, the uh, sovereigns when they come in and they have to see somebody like, where's Tim Curry? Tim? That's our director of security. When they come in, Tim gets up and he starts walking towards them and they start walking the other way, okay? <laughs> um, the training center, um, we plan to uh, teach um, our people, you know, we live in a global society and speaking just English is just not enough anymore. Our, most of our advertising um, items that we have are done in four different languages. Well, we want people to be able to do at least conversational Spanish and conversational Polish. And so we're in the midst of moving in that direction. Our motto, accuracy, efficiency, and advocacy. What lies ahead? These are some of the things we plan to do. Um, we're, we always come up with different ideas of things of how we can create public value and how we can meet the needs of constituents all across Cook County. You have some ideas for some, come talk to me. I'm an idea person, I wanna get it done, and I wanna get it done now. Why don't you partner with us in the recorder's office so that you, we can achieve our goal of becoming the best recorder's office in the United States. Not to say that there aren't some great offices like Fred Buckholz from Duke, DuPage County is with us today and he has an excellent, absolutely excellent recorder's office. We went to visit his office and he's got bells and whistles over there that I want as well. So there you have it. This was our bill signing. Unfortunately, I, you know, I called many of my, my former colleagues would have been here today, but they're in session today and they couldn't be here. But I tell you, I've got a great group of friends in Springfield who have been very, very helpful to me in passing legislation. We will have a legislative agenda this year. We think there's some other things that we can do to make the recorder's office the best that it can be. And with that, I'm done. Okay, okay, all right. All right. Fabulous. All right, look at that. Most of them work for me. <laughs> so, uh, any questions? Actually, the moderator has two. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead. You want to? Yeah, Peely, bring it. Why don't you bring it up? Uh, Stephanie Neely is a great friend of the City Club. What? What actually happened? And I, I never heard of this stuff. I'm embarrassed. I, I know what a sovereign is, but that not the kind of sovereign you're talking about. What? What? I mean, I'm serious. Okay. Okay. Well, what happened, and, and I was hopeful that we, I thought about it at the last minute, that we would bring that article from the New York Times. What happened to her, unbeknownst to her, um, someone, it was done in the, some, some clerics, I'm trying to think of the name of the group that it was, Ali Ba, somebody or other, had, their name was on her chain of title as the owner. They changed the name of the owner on her deed. Okay, that's what they did to her and 30 other people. And you say, how do you do that? Okay, so you can go to any 
store, you know, you can go to Office Max or something. All the documents are there, right, Rich? All the documents are there. So you doctor your paperwork up, you get a rogue notary to notarize it, and then you come to the recorder's office. Now, before I got there, they were just recorded. They are recorded, right? Recorded. They're supposed to record everything. Just do it. And then it goes on your chain of title. And Jill, your name is there, but it's underneath of Rich's name. And now he owns your property. Now it's called paper terrorism, and it, it's it's fraud. But you know, if it happens to you, yeah, can you imagine? Well, and I hope it hasn't happened to you because you haven't checked your chain of title. Right, no, I know, but I I will now that I know. <laughs> All right, Jane Johnson asks, do you plan on running for governor oh. one day? <laughs> That's number one. Hold on, and number two. Do you have a guaranteed iron solution to stopping mortgage ID fraud on property title, so forth and so on? Okay. Right there. No plan to run for governor. None. Zero, zip, zilch. Who would want that job? <laughs> um, and the second question, do I have an ironclad anything? No, I do not. I do not. But what I'm doing today is first letting you know that we have a 21st century problem. One way that you can know about what is happening with your property is to sign up for the Property Fraud Alert Program. Check your chain of title on a, you can check it every day if you want to. If you see something there that shouldn't be there, then you should be calling us, okay? but absolutely, positively will not, under any circumstances, be running for governor. All right, any other questions? So I have one other question, because standing right where you're standing right now, there was a former recorder of deeds who went on to hire office, and what was her name? Carol Mosley Braun, so that's a good question. So uh, let's give her a round of applause. Come on over here. 